So good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the 1145 panel on the sirens of populism. My name is Alina Polyakova. I'm a fellow at the Brookings Institution in Washington, DC. And it's really my honor to be here to moderate not only this distinguished panel on such a relevant topic as we look ahead to the European elections just in a few weeks from now, uh, but also to be at Letter Mary again, uh, which I often say is the best conference in this region, no offense to others, um, that really brings together, I think, everybody I would ever want to see um, in one room. Uh, so absolutely delighted to be here and to introduce this very distinguished set of colleagues for this important conversation. Uh, before I introduce uh, the panel, just a few words of introduction. Uh, you know, all of us have been talking about this slow creep of national populism across Europe and also, you could say, across the, the uh, established democracies of the West, certainly in the United States, uh, is no exception to the rule at this point. And I think the deeper questions that we're asking ourselves now um, are about how the real grievances of populations across Europe, across the West, can be channeled in productive ways. And there are many questions around whether that, the populist movements present that kind of opportunity. Do they accurately represent the desires, grievances um, of the voters of the populations they seek to represent or not? And the bigger question to my mind is what does all of this mean, of course, not just for the future of Europe and the process of European integration, but also for the future of transatlanticism more broadly. So without further ado, uh, to my uh, immediate, let me start with my left. <laughs> um, I have uh, the honor of introducing uh, Minister Miroslav Lajcek, who is the Minister of Foreign and European Affairs of the Slovak Republic. So welcome, fantastic to have you here. Uh, to my immediate right, uh, Minister Takac, who's the Minister of State for European Union Policies of Hungary. Really delighted to have you join. Further to my far right, if you will, um, is Anton, <laughs> Anton Shehavtsov, um, who is lecturer at the University of uh, Vienna and has a recent book um, on the Western European far right and its ties to Russia, which we will get to discussing today um, as well. So thank you for joining, Anton. And to my far left, <laughs> um, although this is not ideologically aligned, um, uh, it's, we have Tom Nadal, who is the Berlin Bureau Chief of The Economist, and has spent a very long time following these trends across Europe. And we might ask him to give us a little bit of a taste of what <coughs> is going on with Brexit and how it all connects to all of this. Um, but Minister uh, Lechek, let me start with you. Um, you've had some really interesting developments in your country recently, and particularly what I'm talking about is the recent election of your new president, who will be inaugurated later in June, um, who is this seemingly dynamic young lawyer. Uh, her election came as a surprise to some. And later, uh, in some commentary, she's been really heralded as kind of a bulwark, uh, you could say, against the rising tide of populism. And, Perhaps also some evidence that populism in Europe has really hit its peak and it's on its way down. Um, how do you see it? Is that the view you take? Well, the election of Zuzana Chaputova is definitely a, a, a great news for my country. It's, uh, mm -hmm. well, I did not expect that uh, someone like her with her views, uh, and she's very outspoken about her views, could get elected president. So uh, I'm very happy about it. it. This is a good news. The fact that we had two good candidates in the second round, both democratic, pro-European, made it very easy for us. Uh, and it was a good news as well. At the same time, the candidates number three and number four represented the worst of the bad. And they collected 25% of the votes. And the difference between the second and third was like 4%. So it could have been a different vote uh, if he made it to the second round. and. Uh, we also had the lowest ever turnout of voters in the second round. That means we had the highest share of, of voters who did not find their candidate uh, in the second rounds. Uh, so therefore, what I'm trying to say, it's a great news. We are happy, I'm personally happy, but is, is it a reason for complacency? Not at all. And uh, we have also recently had a, a poll conducted among the high school, high school students, uh, simulating the parliamentary elections, and in that poll, uh, the winner was uh, the, the, the pro-fascist or the, the semi-fascist party, the worst 
party that we have in, in our system. So, so specifically among young people? Uh, specifically among the people under 18. So therefore, mm -hmm. our society is also divided. These presidential elections delivered a victory for a democratic part of our society. But there is other part of the society that is waiting probably for their chance in upcoming parliamentary ele elections. I really appreciate you bringing up the youth vote here because all of us tend to look to the younger generation to understand what we might see in the future. And one thing that we have not paid, I think, sufficient attention to because we assume that younger people tend to be you know, more liberal, more leftist, right? And then when they get older, they become more conservative. But what you're describing seems to be the opposite trend of that. And I, I'd want to come back to this um, idea you brought up about complacency um, of our understanding of where everything is heading. Uh, but before I come back to that, I want to turn over to you, Minister. Um, First of all, thank you again for being here. I want to bring up a recent event that uh, just occurred, which is, of course, uh, the much uh, reported on visit of your prime minister to the United States, uh, where he seemed to enjoy uh, quite positive rapport with President Trump as well. The meeting seemed to go well uh, from a bilateral perspective, or improving the bilateral relationship. But of course, um, it's also faced a lot of criticism, certainly in the United States. There's been a lot of commentary that uh, the US should do more um, to highlight what some have called you know, the illiberal turn, uh, which uh, the, your prime minister, which uh, the Fidesz party has been leading across Europe. And that's also been uh, highly criticized on the floors of the European Parliament. And of course, as we look towards the elections later this month, you know, how do you see you know, Hungary's place in Europe, given the recent uh, criticism you've faced? <coughs> Well, good afternoon to everybody. It's uh, afternoon already. Uh, thank you very much for having been invited and uh, for this question. I'm very happy to be in the panel with these distinguished people. Uh, the first visit to the, to the US, it was a very good meeting. I think the President of the United States and the Hungarian Prime Minister share almost identical views on some very important global phenomenon, especially immigration, the global terms, and how to fight against immigration, how to stop immigration, especially illegal uh, trends. Uh, they also share similar views on uh, why and how to protect Christian communities uh, all around the world, uh, the most threatened religious community globally. So the two leaders share the same view, case, uh, the fight against uh, terrorism and our cooperation in NATO. I think these, these are very important elements of the, of the discussion in Washington DC this Monday. I think it was Monday. Uh, now on criticism, of course, those who uh, misunderstood uh, the Hungarian Prime Minister uh, probably intentionally misinterpreted uh, him uh, are disappointed now. But uh, maybe you should ask, uh, with due respect, President Trump, Trump why he was not criticizing Orban. I don't know, but my presumption is that he understands Orban very well. And uh, I can say that there was no... <coughs> Uh, turn to illiberalism because we, we, our government has never been liberal. We, we are not a liberal democrats, we are uh, Christian democrats. Uh, and we believe that Christian democracy as well as social democracy has as much legitimacy in European politics mm -hmm. as, uh, as liberal democracy. So if somebody is not liberal, it doesn't mean it's not established democrat. That's our turn and uh, how we see our place in Europe. Uh, well, uh, our primary political goal is to change the migration policy of the European Union and uh, replace those leaders and the top positions of the European institutions who are ardently pro-immigration, which of course is a legitimate position by anybody in Europe, any member state, any government, to be pro-immigration and it should be a, a sovereign decision of any member state. But uh, as long as there is no European uh, political mm -hmm. or legal obligation, uh, to support immigration, I think uh, those like Hungary and others who are following suit, Italy, Austria, V4 countries predominantly, who are not looking at immigration as a positive phenomenon, but something that is a challenge that needs to be tackled uh, outside Europe, uh, they should have the same legitimate uh, place. And it will certainly define our, our political uh, uh, belonging to parties as well. As a matter of fact, when you said I'm sitting to your right, and my friend is sitting to the far right, I should be sitting somewhere on the desk, because if I say that the EPP is somewhere here, EPP is moving there, we are moving there, so I should be sitting on, on the desk. But, mm. So this is where I define our, our political <coughs> position, but uh, 
Of course, uh, we see that the uh, EP elections uh, in one week's time in, in all EU countries uh, will provide a chance for the uh, European people to express their views, how they see the future of Europe, uh, what ambitions they have about security, about immigration. That's why we look forward to the EP elections and let's see the political map being shaped uh, afterwards in the European Parliament and then we will make our decisions on our our belonging. So you mentioned some of the drivers that you see, uh, you know, population demanding some action on, it, whether that be in your own country or the European level. And, and the main thing you point to, of course, is the, the immigration question, uh, which when the refugee crisis first started unfolding in 2015, um, you know, Hungary took, um, I think, you know, a very strong, you could say, uh, put it lightly, a very strong stance on the immigration question. And that has been replicated across some of the countries you mentioned, certainly Italy. Uh, we see some of the similar, similar policies now from the ruling coalition between the League and, and the Five Star, um, and, and some similar policies you could see in places like Austria as well. Um, you know, Anton, I want to get into this question of drivers. Um, you've been following this issue for many years, as, as I have as well, and I think there's still this ongoing debate. You know, why uh, are we seeing this continued growth in populist movements, both on the left and the right? Uh, we tend to focus on the right, but we should certainly not uh, forget that there's also a left, um, a uh, so far left to, to this question as well. And you know, the minister brings up this uh, question of immigration, and that seems to be now really the crux uh, of what is defining, uh, you could say, the right populist ideology in a really profound way. Right. Um, so do you think that the reason why we're seeing this growth and support for you know, these you say anti-immigrant or more uh, strict immigration policies um, is really because these are the only parties that are really able to answer those demands from the voters, or is there something else here? Alina, it's, 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 one, of the, it's one of the factors. Uh, but basically, well, since I'm sitting on the far right, let me be a sort of uh, a devil's advocate here. Um, in the 90s, there has been uh, a contract between the losers of globalization and the winners of globalization. Uh, the winners of globalization promised, well, unofficially, because it's, you know, it's, a, it's, a social, it's the social contract, to compensate to the losers of globalization everything that they lost. You know, the blue-collar workers, uh, people who lost their jobs because, the, because their, I don't know, factories and plants would be transferred to, say, uh, China, whatever. So people who really lost because of globalization. So there were people who, who won, and there are people who lost. So there was this, uh, this social contract. And the, the winners of globalization broke this contract twice in the recent years. Uh, the first time they broke this contract was the financial crisis of 2008, 2009. Because the, the, all the banks, <coughs> they, they, they made it without any, basically any problem. And the austerity policies, they hit people hard. People on, you know, the, with lower education, even with, you know, idle, even the middle class, they were all hit by the financial crisis, and the winners of globalization did not compensate for this. So that was a treason, in my opinion, yeah. of the people who would then think of, you know, voting for the far right, because essentially the far right became the new socialist party globally. They were defending. The, the welfare <coughs> state or you know the, the, the social poli uh, policies in, in in the Western world, but that was only one uh, case of break of breaking the contract. The another uh, an, another case Sorry, was the uh, the refugee about. crisis, mm -hmm. because people did not subscribe to bring the refugees in European Union. They did not subscribe to Merkel's idea of opening the borders. You mean there was no vote? Well, oh yes, uh, there was no vote. And people who voted for Merkel, or people who voted for the conservatives, they realized the conservatives, because first, the, with, the, with, the, um, with the financial crisis, the social democrats betrayed the people, betrayed those who, as well, essentially, uh, were losers of globalization, but then, the conservatives betrayed uh, the losers of globalization after the refugee crisis. They did not subscribe mm. to this. 
So you have a backlash, and this is all too logical. Because, yeah, now the losers globalization have their vote, and they, and they vote for the far right, in the hope that they are the only force that can, you know, make things right again. So, and this is just the beginning. Let me be very clear. There is no, uh, there is, it's not, the, it's not the peak of the right-wing populist surge. It's just the beginning. There is no turning back. There will never be a time when you would have only this competition between the conservatives and the social democrats. No, it's all gone. Mm -hmm. we, we, we saw this in France, that two anti-establishment politicians were in the second round. We will see it in other places. Um, governments, including the far right, will be a much more common thing in the future. So we're going to see many more Italys um, than perhaps Absolutely. France's. Right, in terms yeah. of who's able to shore up that center. You know, Tom, before I turn to you, I wonder if I could just take a moment to um, you know, have the minister, uh, Mr. Lechek, respond um, to the idea that Anton just put out, this notion that um, the rise of the right and you could say the left to some extent as well is one side of a broader uh, trend, which is the failure of the center, especially the center left, to provide real, tangible solutions to individuals who've been hit the hardest uh, by some of these trends of um, globalization, the refugee crisis, and that the center still um, is lacking those ideas, um, and that we're going to see more and more of these uh, center-right, far-right coalition governments um, over the longer term. What, what do you think about that? How does, does that ring true for your experience in your country? Well, um, I, I would like to disagree, but I cannot. The fact is that Europe is now going through a huge crisis of confidence in the system, in the mainstream political parties, and it all started with the financial crisis. And the fact is that people saw for the first time that the system is unable to respond to this new situation. It took us more than two years to come up with a solution, and the solution hit the people hard, that, that's clear. And then it was followed uh, shortly by the migration crisis, where the response from the institutions was terrible. Uh, insensitive and very bureaucratic, as if migration is a bureaucratic issue. It's a complex political, social, economic, security problem, and the Commission was trying to address it in its typical way, administrative bureaucratic methods. And yes, and this added to the fact that people uh, got the feeling that the, the, the system no longer works for them, that the political parties who represent the status quo are unable to uh, deal with their problems, and this, of course, uh, open the space for anti-system parties. And uh, yes, uh, the question is whether these parties have a real solutions. I, I, thi I think they don't, they don't but uh, I mean the, the, the standard parties, mainstream parties, created so much room for criticism that they, they have entered this room and, and are criticizing the system. So the fact is that these European elections will no longer be uh, the competition between center-right, center-left, but it will be a competition between the system and anti-system. Mm -hmm. uh, mainstream parties who represent the status quo and the uh, anti-system parties who are challenging the status quo. I'm afraid what this challenge can deliver because I have not been convinced by uh, what these anti-system parties are offering, but unfortunately I have also not seen adequate reaction from mainstream parties, from the system parties, to win the trust of people back. So the, the response of the center is what you're saying has been technocratic, yes. while the response from the right has been political. Well, it was the critical to the technocratic response. Mm -hmm. I have not seen a credible alternative. But uh, if you, I mean, if you make mistakes, then you allow the other people to criticize your mistakes, and people are impressed by the criticism mm -hmm. because this is they they, uh, they 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 speak out what they feel, and but what is missing here is the asking these anti-system parties. What is the alternative? Mm -hmm. tell, us, uh, tell us what you propose. I mean, to criticize is not enough. Mm -hmm. It's easy to criticize, but I have not seen a credible alternative to it. And what is, uh, I would also say that I would caution against, I mean, labeling too much far right mm -hmm. populists, because sometimes we call populist everyone who does not share our views. But I think it on only supports those who are anti system. If you are like ostracized and you are labeled as, as not being you know, good enough 
to be part of the mainstream, that this antagonizes the people even more. So I would be careful in choosing how we define each other and how we call each other. Yes, yeah, so populism is not an ideology, right? It's a political tool yeah. um, that can be used by centrists or leftists or rightists or whoever. But again, I think your point about what do we call who as the center left, center right, the entire political spectrum is really breaking down, I think is, is a big question. So Tom, let me, let me pull you into this conversation. Um, I want to get your take on sort of the big picture view. You've been reporting on this issue, many other issues, kind of tracking the political trends in Europe more broadly. Now you, you sit in Berlin. Um, you know, I thought something that uh, Anton said was really interesting, that we have not hit you know, peak populism yet, and this is just the beginning. Uh, I think what's interesting about Germany, of course, is that the, uh, the alternative for Germany, the AfD, was kind of a late comer to this field, uh, but now is causing a lot of headaches um, for the CDU and the SPD, the center, and making it increasingly more difficult uh, to form strong coalition governments. In Germany, we also see this in Sweden, of course, um, in some of the Baltic states in recent elections where it takes months to form a government. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that these parties from the fringes are making that much more difficult. Um, where do you see all of this going? Um, do you agree with Anton's uh, general assessment that we haven't hit the peak yet? I mean, I think I would start by saying that I'm not sure to what extent Germany fits into that schema. Um, because, I mean, I only arrived in Berlin six months ago, but the alternative for Deutschland has not been much of a story in Germany for the last six months. It hasn't been climbing in the polls. And their success in the last federal election in 2017 was not really the main explanation for why it took a while for Germany to get a coalition together. Um, although, of course, it does complicate the, the parliamentary arithmetic, but to nothing like the same extent as in other countries. More broadly, um, I think I, I, I sort of partially agree with this notion that um, I, I'm th thinking about the different kind of schemas that you can use to ana analyze what's happening in European politics and, and we'll see what happens in the European elections next week. It's clearly true that you need uh, a more sophisticated uh, dimension than kind of the old left versus right. But I do want to emphasize that that still very much matters. I was in Brussels for four years before I moved to, to, uh, to Germany. And if you were looking at the everyday work of policymaking and, and lawmaking there, then if you wanted to understand and political differences, um, the, the way that the, that the sausage was made, that was still the best way to do it. Um, I think what we're going to see in this next election, we will see multiple different dimensions. You'll see left versus right. You will see, I don't know what you want to call it, sort of open versus closed, liberal versus national. But you will also see, I think, something which perhaps we talk about a little bit less, um, what you might call sort of pro or anti-status quo. And that doesn't map on to the same sort of dimensions as, as the other categories that we've mentioned. Here, for example, you have France and Germany on opposite sides of the, of the divide. Uh, Germany very much a status quo power. Um, France under President Macron uh, pushing for some fairly radical changes. So I think the story of these European parliamentary elections isn't so much going to be populism or nationalism. I think it's going to be fragmentation. And that's a kind of woolly, uh, less sexy theme. Um, but I think it's going to be a better way to understand what's going to happen in the parliament after the elections. It will help explain, for example, why I think the, the Spitzen candidate and the lead candidates to be president of the European Commission might struggle to muster any sort of majority in this parliament, because it will be much more fragmented. Um, and I also think that if we're thinking about the ability of these what we on this panel are calling populist to influence what's happening in the European Union, we should at least ground that in a correct understanding of the way that the EU works. Um, even at the most expansive definition, I think running from mild Eurosceptics to out-to-out you know, -out fascists, the, what you might call the anti-EU wing in the European Parliament may occupy a third of the seats at best. I'd be more worried about what may happen inside the next uh, European Commission, the commissioners that some of these governments are going to send, inside the European Council. These are meant to be consensual bodies, unlike the European Parliament, which should be a rowdy forum um, for dissent. Um, and my final point, this is not a particularly original one, but I think it still holds, is that we should be very 
skeptical about the ability of what you might call the populist international to, to coalesce around a coherent set of policies that could actually influence the, uh, the future direction of Europe. And you see that today, Matteo Salvini and Marine Le Pen are in Milan um, launching their new movement. Uh, they're beset by questions over what's happened to their friends in Austria who have been hit by a, a scandal that I'm sure everybody saw we'll break get to that. We'll overnight. Get to that. Yeah, nope, sure. <laughs> um, but maybe more to the, more to the point, um, they have not been able to recruit to their cause several parties that are sometimes described as like-minded in Poland, in Sweden, in Hungary, notably because of differences over Russia, but there are plenty of other policy differences as well. So I'm hesitant when people start raising red flags and saying that these guys are going to blow up the European Union from the inside, because they struggled to do that before. I think they might struggle to do it in the future. Thanks, Tom. Um, and Minister, could I go, go back to you for a moment? And I do want to talk about the Austria, the unfolding Austria situation. Um, perhaps some of you have been following the news on this in just a moment. Uh, but before, uh, while we're still kind of talking about these broad trends and looking forward to the European elections, um, you know, some of the um, ideas that have been brought up on the panel so far, I just want to get your response. I think uh, one um, uh, interesting thing to look at that I'd be curious to get your thoughts on um, is this question of fragmentation that Tom just brought up, that we're going to see more and more of this at the European level. Uh, we're going to see, um, as a result, um, struggles to form any sort of factions or coalitions. Um, and I'm just curious, you know, as we see you know, some of the other parties like Salvini and Le Pen trying to at least form some sort of uh, faction, some sort of new movement, um, and given, again, the, the the tensions between the EPP and, and FIDESH at the, at the European level. Where, where do you see you know, your, your government's party, uh, FIDESH, um, kind of fitting in into this new European uh, political party spectrum as it becomes more fragmented, more divided as the center right and, and, and your party perhaps split? I'm not sure where that's going, but what do you think about some of these trends? <clears throat> it's a very, very exciting question you are, you are, you are touching up on, uh, definitely. But be before I answering your question, let me get back to what Minister Lajcak mm -hmm. said about being cautious about labeling. I think this is a very, very bad uh, narrative and a very bad direction. Simply, if you are not following the, what we call the mainstream Brussels bubble narrative, that is, you are not federalist, and you are not pro-immigration, rather you are national, and you are sovereign, and you are Christian, you are conservative, you are anti-immigration, then you immediately become populist. I think we have to be very careful with this word. You are, you are using this word populist and uh, as a already negative connotation. I wouldn't like to go into linguistics and semantics, but if you look at the root of these words like uh, democracy and populism, you will find that the two roots, demos in Greek and uh, populus in Latin, they all mean the people, uh, that you represent the people. I think you are mixing demagoguery with populism. I know that it has been hijacked by liberal politics, but that's a problem. Uh, you, you can call someone a demagogue who is exploiting uh, prejudice <coughs> and ignorance, and that, that's bad, but mm -hmm. that's not populism. As a matter of fact, uh, political elite, I think, is completely shifted away from the people. There's a huge gap, and politicians in the European Union have been complaining about that, that there's a gap between the people and the political elite, which is the case, but we should answer uh, the reasons for that. Now, so that's worth talking about that, anyway. Um, but let, let me quote one example. There was a very exciting uh, meeting recently in Florence, in Italy, and um, it was about, it, it's a pro-family meeting. But it was labeled as an anti, it's a fascist and populist and I, I don't know what kind of uh, adjectives they were used. Uh, Italian liberal media was crazy about it. And there was this guy who was invited to the conference, uh, a, a uh, pro-LGBT uh, right uh, kind of activist. And he said that he cannot subscribe to anything what he said at this conference. He's completely against it. But creating this hysteria around that, this is not part of democracy. I think he's one of the last surviving liberals, genuine liberals in Europe. Uh, Who? I don't know what the name of the person was, okay. but you know, uh, the, it doesn't really matter. But this guy was completely <laughs> against, I was not there at the conference, but I, I read about it. So he was completely against 
the whole notion, the whole philosophy of this conference, but he went there, he expressed his view, and he respected the view of others there. Now, that's uh, genuine liberalism, I believe. Now, politics, in European politics, what will happen? Uh, what we see is that uh, the three center parties, uh, the conservatives, the European People's Party, the socialists, and the liberals, are moving closer and closer to each other, so there's a, a growing proximity. The division among them is, is very, very little, almost obsolete. Uh, they give the same political answer to the same questions. There is no real difference. These uh, parties are losing their character, and they will, they will have to merge in order to form a majority of the European Parliament, which probably they will. But uh, the Greens will take away many votes, presumably, from the socialists, from the liberals. And uh, what uh, Minister Leutscher called the anti-system or anti-establishment parties, to the right of this uh, entity, will be strengthened as well. We believe that uh, our government party and parties, uh, Fidesz and the Christian Democrats, we have not moved away from EPP. The EPP has moved away from the EPP. They have gone too much to the left. And it's, if, if there was no Hungary issue, what we call the Hungary issue, uh, regardless of that, uh, we, could, we could barely subscribe to what the EPP has been representing for the last couple of years. Just give you some examples. Uh, the EPP is supporting qualified majority voting in foreign policy and security policy, which we don't subscribe to. The same applies to taxation, European level taxation. These are very important sectoral policy areas where we cannot really align ourselves with the European People's Party. The Spitzenkandidat and the Tom Nadel uh, raised. That's a mechanism that we never liked. Uh, there is nothing new about it. The Hungarian Prime Minister voted against the Spitzenkandidat five years ago. It was only him and David Cameron who did not vote Mr. Juncker at the time. Because we believe that the Spitzenkandidat mechanism, on the one hand, gives too much power to the European Parliament beyond what is enshrined in the treaties for them, for the Parliament. <coughs> it's one thing. The other thing is that it's very undemocratic. Now, I mean, at the time, five years ago, the Tory party, uh, could not support it because they were not part of it. They were completely ignored. Now, the French don't like the Spitzenkandidat. Uh, en Marche does not belong to any of the big groups for the time being. Mm -hmm. The Polish don't like it, the Italians don't like it, the Slovenians don't like it, we don't like it. I think uh, this is not a good me mechanism, it's undemocratic, uh, and the EPP supports that. So that, these are some of the reasons mm -hmm. why we are, we would like to, to stay in the EPP, but, uh, in order to reach that, the EPP has to stay in the EPP. Uh, they have to stick to the traditional Christian democratic values mm -hmm. of Adenauer, or I, I might say Helmut Kohl as well, from most recently. And this will define our place. It doesn't mean that we will join a new alliance. Uh, we will have to see the political map, as I told you mm -hmm. in, in, in the first intervention, and, and then we will have to make our decisions what to do. Thank you, Minister. It's a really interesting analysis. Um, we'll see what happens. Uh, before I switch to some of the, the current events that are going on and, and maybe get you, Tom, to weigh in a little bit on the UK and, you know, the, the greatest irony being that, of course, uh, the UK, despite Brexit, is still having to run candidates in the European elections. Um, you know, I'd be curious to get your take on what you think about that. Uh, but, you know, uh, Anton, just for a very quick comment from you, we've been talking about this labeling issue that both ministers have brought up and, um, and Tom has also brought up. Can you define populism for us in one to two sentences? Well, well there, is, there is a sort of a consensus in the academia and uh, uh, academic work is, is, my, is my background. Uh, populism is, of course, it's not an ideology. Uh, it's more of a language. and uh, It's a language of dividing the society into two antagonistic groups the largest groups is the, the common people, and the, uh, the second group is the, the elites. So, this is the, so the, the language of dividing um, uh, the society into these groups is the, is the language of populism. Uh, what's, what's interesting um, is that sometimes populists get into power, and they lose this access to, and this opportunity to talk about the, the people and the corrupt elites, because they become the elites. And in, uh, in the majority of cases, uh, they transnationalize this notion or this uh, populist language uh, 
So, for example, our country becomes this common, common people, and then the Brussels is the corrupt elites. So, sort of, uh, because they don't, because you can't criticize the elites if you are in power. It, it's just, it's simply impossible. So, we see in every country where right-wing populists become uh, part of the government, they sort of, they try to, if they want to be successful, if they want to keep in power, they need to transnationalize this, uh, uh, this, um, this conflict and this divide. But I'm, I'm fascinated, of course, by the new terminology like Christian democracy. Uh, there's, um, there's, of course, this uh, conflict uh, or this, uh, this problematic uh, use of the word Christian because in the end, we have to go back to at least some Christian values and you know, ask ourselves what, what Christ would say about immigration. I mean, would he uh, say, oh, let's build the walls? Let's build the walls, and uh, would he use the word pro-migration, pro-immigrant forces? I think his approach of Jesus Christ to refugees would be a bit more different, uh, at least, uh, than the current government in Hungary. Okay, well, I don't want to get into a sort of a religious conversation about the tenets of Christianity and what uh, Jesus Christ would have thought. That could, that's a whole different uh, discussion we could have here, but point well taken. Um, I want to expand out a little bit and really get to the juicy newsy uh, piece that, um, Tom, you already put on the table. Um, you know, one thing that you, you said, Tom, uh, regarding the fact that these political parties are having trouble forming a coalition or a faction or some sort of movement is because of disagreements on Russia as one specific element. Of course, there's been a lot of reporting on how the Russian government has sought for many years to try to um, have these deep relationships um, with some far, of the far-right parties across the movement, including some financial support. Uh, we know this for certain in the case of Le Pen's, uh, what was formerly called the National Front, but also some, you could say, media or PR support, which we saw for the AFD um, in the recent German elections where they were given a lot of airtime on uh, Kremlin-sponsored networks like RT and Sputnik, et cetera, that they wouldn't have had that kind of amplification mm -hmm. capabilities uh, otherwise, and of course, on social media as well. So, of course, the the, the most uh, uh, present news that's with us today um, has been this breaking story coming from Austria regarding uh, this apparent uh, deal that the Freedom Party uh, had Straha was trying to have with who he thought representatives of uh, the Russian government or the, or the Russian elite. And now we've had this uh, leak come out of the entire meeting out there on video. Um, you know, one, Tom, let me start with you, and I'll go to Anton, who's obviously written a whole book on this issue, so uh, I, will, I will leave it to you last, um, and since you're based in Austria as well. But Tom, since you brought, put this on the table, you know, what is gonna happen? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, uh, the first thing I should say is that I think um, uh, Sebastian Kurz was due to speak on this at noon, which was about half an hour ago, so it's possible that it may already have happened. I haven't been checking the news up here on no, stage. No, because but the audience we, we are one hour ahead of <laughs> Austria, so... Ah, yes, of course we happen. are. Yes, sorry, we're in a different time zone. Yes, we've got to wait <laughs> half an hour. My, uh, I, I mean, I mean, clearly the, the coalition can't continue in its current form. Possibly it will um, break down entirely. Um, but, I, but clearly there's a bigger point here as well. I think this is a huge challenge for Sebastian Kurz. His proposition when he brought the Freedom Party into government was that I, a responsible member of the Centre to right of a Christian Democratic Party can manage these guys, I can tame them in government. And this was the message that he brought. I was in Brussels at the time. He came to Brussels al almost immediately after the election and was reassuring the Commission and, and other member states that they didn't need to worry about what an Austrian government with a far right inside would do. Now, this, this video undermines that message quite strongly, it also undermines the message of those, including the Hungarian government, who have said the Austrian model is the correct one to follow, that the centre-right ought not to be shifting to the left, as, as the minister was saying, but it ought to, ought to be thinking about ways to work with um, uh, the populist right. Uh, this is a, a, a huge, it's a dagger in the heart of that proposition. Um, and the way that this story plays out in Austria, I think, could have quite strong implications for this broader debate across Europe. I mean, this is, this is 12 hours old, this story, so we don't know how it's, how it's going to shake out, but I, th I think it, it does have implications that could extend significantly beyond Austria. Just, just very quickly, uh, Tom just used a really uh, 
interesting phrase, a dagger in the heart um, of the proposition that the Austrian model works for other countries like Hungary. Uh, wh what, do you, what do you think of that, Minister? Yeah. <coughs> May I respond to my friend from Russia, uh, what he said <coughs> first? Uh, uh, sure. From uh, Anton, you mean? Yeah. I'm not from Russia. He's not from uh, Russia. Oh, He's sorry. from Ukraine. I'm from Ukraine. <laughs> uh, <laughs> even better. Uh, I think what he said about Jesus Christ. You know, <laughs> what the uh, Bible said about uh, Jesus Christ. Okay, I, would I, will like give you, really, I will give you one I, minute I would on Jesus like to Christ. Bring <laughs> Jesus Christ to this room. Uh, if you, you are a believer, he's here. It's mm. very personal. I don't know. But what he suggested, what he proposed, as there was no legitimacy for Christian democratic policies. As if only liberal democracy has a legitimate right. Typical demagoguery, a typical liberal approach. There's a problem here. I think we, we, we have to define what we mean by Christian democracy. You suggested that such term does not exist, Christian values. And you attach uh, Christian values only uh, something that to, is, to, is one, to one issue, how, how you look at immigration and refugee crisis. And that's another typical approach that you are smudging refugee crisis with immigration. Two completely different things. You know it very well. You all know it very well. That we can very easily make a difference between refugees and migrants, economic mi migrants. Two completely different categories. You should not pretend as if you did not understand the differences between them. Probably Jesus Christ would not supporting bringing in Europe radical ideologies that are threatening the Judeo-Christian identity of this continent. Because this was also happening. Since the outbreak of the immigration crisis, there has been 31 terrorist attacks in Europe. 300 Europeans died. 1,300 Europeans were injured. Why are we not talking about that? Why there is no legitimate platform for talking about this problem as well? So I think it's a, you know, this insinuation as if there were no Christian values and what would Jesus Christ say? You know, this is the exact difference between demagoguery and populism. If you are going into, but I think this panel is not uh, uh, maybe uh, good for discussing these uh, uh, terms and terminological pr problems of populism, demagoguery, and all that stuff. So your question whether the model in Austria might work uh, everywhere. Why not? Because there is, a, there is an issue with the details of which I don't know, and uh, it has not been analyzed uh, substantially. I wouldn't like to comment on this. I don't know. We will have to see okay. the details. The Austrian Chancellor will react. The Freedom Party in Austria will rea react on that. I, I wouldn't like to prejudge the outcome of this debate. Uh, what we know is that there is a government in Austria which is elected. There is a government coalition and uh, they will make decisions uh, uh, on that. So uh, I don't know why we would like to de derive a uh, more Europe-wide uh, consequence from that, whether this model could work or not. Well, in Hungary, we are not cooperating with the far right. Uh, the far right are people who are listing Jews in Hungary. They suggested that we should list who is Jewish, who is not. The same was the Hungarian liberals, the socialists. Uh, they also proposed that we should list who is Jewish, who is not. We have a problem with that. We have a problem of anti-Semitism all over Europe. We have a problem with anti-Semitism in Western Europe, especially, which is uh, connected to radical Islam. We have a huge problem with that. We have a problem with losing the Judeo-Christian identity of Europe. And uh, this is related to immigration, changing the ethnic map of Europe. We have a problem with that. And we would like to preserve this Judeo-Christian identity. We have a legitimate right to express our position. And it has nothing to do with populism and strache and whatever. So, uh, you know, we are not talking about models. You cannot uh, use the same size fit tall approach in every country. It depends. Uh, but you should, uh, I think, respect the rules of democracy when parties are elected legitimately. And if there's a scandal, they will answer that. That's what I can say about it. I will hold my own thoughts as the moderator on this panel. Um, Anton, I don't want to get into the deep conversation of uh, what, what, what would have Jesus done um, or what have Jesus thought that you put on the table. Uh, but if you want to make a couple of comments about the recent Austrian developments, I will leave that to you. And then I would like to turn it to the audience um, to do the hard job uh, for me of asking hard questions. Go ahead. Yeah, so the, the scandal that uh, developed yesterday in Austria, I will not go into detail uh, much about this. You will read in the news or you've, you've read already in the news. 
This tells us something about the, the mentality of the far right in general. Uh, this tells us particularly about some of the, um, some of the elements of the far right, because the, the far right scene in Europe is quite diverse, it's quite heterogeneous. It tells us something about the far right as I would call them the merchants of fear. Uh, those people, and, and social psychologists, they, 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 they write a lot about this, that there is, there is a genuine anxiety in, in European societies about uh, various threats, including the terrorist threats, including um, austerity policies, excluding uh, migration. These are, these are objective threats, or people perceive them as such. But instead of trying to ease these anxieties and tend to the, those fears or address the fears, try to you know, make, make lives better, the far right, including some of the uh, parties that call themselves Christian democratic, they try to sell this fear. They want to capitalize on this fear in order to keep in power. Because in the end, they are not only merchants of fear, but in the end, they are merchants. What happened in Austria, it shows us how easily the merchants of fear are ready to sell out the national interests of their own countries. It is so, it, it, it's, all, it's always, you know, play, play and, and a game about the, 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 uh, the terms and definitions. They call themselves patriots, but they are the first ones to sell out the interests of their countries to the foreign powers. They are the first ones. Not even the liberals. We can talk about, you know, the, the problem with liberalism and patriotism, but the far right who call themselves patriotic, they are the first ones to sell mm -hmm. out. And this is what happened in Austria. Interestingly, there was no Russia involved, and I'm, 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 I'm absolutely fascinated by this. They, the, the party that has a co cooperation agreement with the United Russia Party in Austria, and that's the same in, in Italy, they did not really have any support from the Kremlin. They could not even cons consult with the Kremlin or with people who represent the Kremlin or whatever, whether the situation they were engaged in on those uh, conversations they were uh, engaged in in Ib on Ibiza, whether they were legitimate or not. So you don't really need Russia to, to basically um, um, to damage your reputation. And this is something very interesting. And uh, also very interesting is that uh, in Austria, uh, there was little, if any, support for the far right, because, because in the end, and this is also uh, a case of uh, some other European countries, Russia does not need to interfere yes. in some of the countries in Europe because it's totally satisfied with the situation That's there. That's right, we're, we're doing all the damage that benefits Russian interest ourselves. Yes, sometimes some leaders are doing even better than Russians work right. uh, in their own societies. That's right. Um, you know, this is a really interesting point because um, of all the discussion of a Russian interference or Russian influence across democracies, well, that is real, and we have a lot of evidence at this point uh, for the Russian intent to try to destabilize and sow chaos in democratic societies. Of course, the problem starts with our own kind of organic domestic issues where the Russians just play at the margins and try to amplify them where they can, but most of the time, it's our own societies that need to really look inward and deal with some of the trends we're seeing in terms of polarization, in terms of the divisions we mentioned, um, that you put on the table among young people as well, uh, Minister Lechek. Lechek, I mean, there's been a lot we've been discussing here. Yes. Um, before I give Tom kind of the final word and the moderator part of the panel to talk about Brexit, I want to see if you want to respond to really anything. I'll leave the table open to you of the conversations we've been having so far. First, on the Austrian situation, politically, of course, it's, uh, the, their democratic system will deal with, the, situ with, with the, the situation here. Politologically, I believe this is a confirmation of what I said in the beginning of this discussion, namely that the FPÖ is a party that represents anti-system. And they come in on criticizing the system and, and uh, promising that they will be better. 
but they they have no I mean solutions to the problems and they are no better as a matter of fact they are worse because they they represent the worst of the status quo party of the system party corruption and and no respect for I mean the, the fundamental principles of ethics and, and, and morale. So this is a good uh, example for all those who still believe that there are prophets who, uh, who offer easy solutions and easy ways out. Uh, second, yeah, we are here to discuss. We are, if, if we all were here to agree on everything, then we don't need to, to organize this, this conference. So I, I really suggest that we listen to each other and, 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 uh, and uh, engage in a dialogue here. Uh, I, uh, well, my colleague from Hungary is representing the views that uh, not everybody agrees with, but uh, uh, they are legitimate. I so, and, and, and we are here to, to try to understand w why he's saying this and, 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 and to engage in a, in a discussion about it. The provocative question that you just alluded to is if uh, democracies lead to an outcome that liberals or you know, so many don't like, does that mean that we're in a crisis of democracy, or does that mean we're in a crisis of liberalism? Um, and so, Tom, you don't have to answer that rhetorical question, uh, but I do want to think a little bit uh, to give you a couple of minutes to talk us through what you see happening um, in, in the UK with Brexit. We don't need to go through it all, uh, but obviously the, the Prime Minister just said that she will resign uh, before the next uh, negotiations begin. We don't know who uh, is really going to take the lead uh, for the Conservative Party. Um, the whole thing just seems to be unraveling. And then on top of that, there is a campaign in which people like Nigel Farage, in which uh, some of the pro-Brexit uh, political parties um, and movements are, seem to be polling very high ahead of the European elections. So this, this great irony here, right? Um, what do you, how do you make sense of all of this? Well, Brexit has, has taken up far too much of my life in the last six months, so I don't want to take it too much time of this panel, but um, uh, uh, so I mean, a huge caveat first, this, this election that we're gonna have in Britain, the European election, I, I mean, it's, it's completely kind of bizarre, right? And nobody wanted it, Britain didn't want it, the EU didn't want it. It's also, I think, kind of sui generis. It, there's now a sort of Brexit political logic that has taken hold in Britain that explains the developments there that is more or less, I think, detached from um, most of the phenomena that we've been <clears throat> describing here. So I wouldn't necessarily draw too many conclusions from it either for the future of the EU or for the future of British politics. Um, what we're seeing, I think, if you look at the opinion polls, um, it, it looks extraordinary. You know, Nigel Farage comes at creates a party out of nothing and all of a sudden he's leading the opinion polls. Um, but uh, you can look at it another way. It looks like his Brexit party is on track to win roughly the same share of votes as his uh, party that he used to lead, UKIP, did at the last European elections. And if you add up the votes that all of the pro, the, the unequivocal pro-Remain parties are getting, and unfortunately there's a lot of them because they haven't been able to team up, they're probably going to win roughly the same share as that Brexit party. So in other words, what we're seeing is the country is completely polarised around Remain and Leave, and the mainstream parties don't know what to do in a split. Stop the press, right? I mean, we knew that already. So that doesn't tell us a huge amount about where British politics is going. Um, as for the EU, uh, I mean, this is possibly going to complicate uh, decision making inside the European Union. You're now going, it's going to change the arithmetic a little bit inside the European Parliament. As you mentioned, it's, it's going to hasten the departure of Theresa May. She may be replaced by Boris Johnson, who may attempt to embark on a fresh round of fruitless negotiations that aren't going to lead anywhere. So this thing is, it is starting to infect European politics. For what it's worth, I was slightly surprised that the last extension to the negotiations um, or, or to the Article 50 process was agreed so readily because the line from people like President Macron was always that we have to make sure that the EU is insulated from the mess of Brexit. It doesn't infect our everyday business. And they did a very good job of that for two years, but now it is actually starting to infect it. So although the feeling in London, as far as I can tell, seems to be that when the next extension expires in, expires in October, if we want to further one, it will be granted. I'm a little bit more skeptical about that. I wonder if this thing can really go on that long. So thank you, Tom. Uh, so with that, I want to, we have 30 minutes for the audience discussion. Uh, from the reaction in the room, I think we have a lot of questions. So I will just ask you to introduce yourself and please do not give us a lecture. That's what the panel has been for. Uh, please ask a question. I saw Edward Lucas. I, 
Minister, it seems to me that the epitome of Christian democracy would be discussing what the teachings of Jesus Christ mean for today. We can have different views on that, but I think it's unfair to Anton to say that was a demagogic response. You can disagree, but that's good. But my question is that um, is what's new here? Protest parties are as old as democracy. Um, is the new element that something has changed in our political system with the role of finance and money in politics? Is it the growth of supranational structures that people feel alienated from, they don't feel they can connect with? Or is it that technology has given the protest parties new ways of, as they would see it, breaching the cartel or the monopoly, new ways of reaching voters, new ways of spreading information and perhaps disinformation? So um, we'll get back to the Bible later, but what's the new element here? And Edward, is that a question to... Anton or anybody on the panel? Anyone who wants to answer that. Okay. Who so what's new? What's new here? Anton? The, I think, well, if, if we are talking about right-wing populism, essentially, uh, you know it's, uh, as much as I do, that this is a new, not a new phenomenon. Uh, the current wave, it started not, not 10 years ago. It started already in the 1980s. So there's um, the satisfaction with the, with the traditional parties. It started already then. Um, new is, is just the, the, the topics, the themes on, on which um, the, these far-right parties uh, capitalize. Uh, what's interesting, and something that I would say new in comparison to the 1990s, is that uh, before, the before, the, before, this uh, before this century, uh, far-right parties in, in Europe, especially in Western Europe, were economically neoliberal. That was essentially something that defined them to, to, uh, to a certain extent. But they realized that uh, the votes that they were having were coming mostly from the blue-collar workers, from the working class, who felt betrayed by the Social Democrats, already then, already in the 90s. And then they followed, uh, they followed their own electorate in turning towards, in, in, in reshaping their own economic policies from neoliberal to sort of, you know, more socialist approach. And in, in many cases, uh, the far right became the new, the new left, essentially. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, in, in terms of the economy. This is, this is new, but this is new, you know, in comparison, like, say, 20, 25 years, but uh, I don't see anything really new uh, in, the, in the recent surge. Just as quickly, I, since... Um, if, if I may... Yes, one second. I will, I'll pass it over to you shortly. Um, since, Edward, you mentioned the, the technological uh, component here, um, I do think that is new, the digital revolution. And if we look at how um, the more, you can say, fringe parties um, have been using digital tools, they're, in fact, much more effective and knowing how to uh, amplify their messages, uh, spread their messages um, across the social media information space online. Um, and this uh, makes them look much bigger than they actually are, perhaps in real life. And so I think that specific tool is new, and we haven't quite figured out what that will mean for the future of democracy. So, Minister, please. Well, you just said what I oh, wanted I'm to say. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, what I wanted to say is that the, what is new here is the presence and the role of social media. Yes. Uh, and as a consequence, the line between truth and untruth has become blurred completely. There are so many truths that no, no one, nobody knows what is truth and what is not. So you can say whatever you want, you can preach whatever you want, and you will always find some justifications or some proofs for, for your platform. So, and, and also, as a consequence, we have a society that lives in different worlds, in different bubbles, because following different news, different media, and engaging in different discussions, and not uh, within these groups and not between these groups. And this is rather dangerous. Yes, the so-called echo chambers that we, that we see forming online. I saw two questions on this side. Uh, first, uh, the lady to your right, Michal. <coughs> if you could just please introduce yourself. Thank you. My name is Jana Polierin. I work for a German think tank called the German Council on Foreign Relations. And I have a question to uh, Minister Leitchek. And I would like to come back to something that you said earlier when you talked about the root causes for the frustration and you said about the migration crisis that it was basically also a failure of the Commission with its technocratic 
approach. And I want to challenge you on that because I think uh, when it comes to European migration, the European institutions are not in the driver's uh, seat. I mean, uh, the responsibility for asylum policy lies with the member states. The responsibility for border protection lies with the member states. And even what Frontex does or doesn't do uh, lies with the member states. So wouldn't it be more honest instead of kind of singing the song of we have to take back uh, control from Brussels and uh, these bureaucrats uh, to acknowledge that it's a failure of the member states actually to, to agree on anything and that this blaming the EU for not delivering is also kind of um, the wrong approach because uh, we have to be honest of what the EU institutions can and cannot deliver. So before you answer that question, since there's a question right next to you, yes. let me take these together. Hi, Michał Baranowski, uh, GMF Warsaw. Thank you for a fascinating debate uh, so far, but I think we are still a little bit too polite. I mean, we have focused, and I don't mean to be impolite now, right now, but uh, I mean, we <laughs> Go focus- Go ahead, Michal, just put it uh, out there. <laughs> we, we, we focus on, I think, legitimate debates about um, uh, migration systems, about the future of European Union, um, about you know relations with the US, whatnot. But when we talk about the nature of democracy, there are some lines that should not be um, uh, crossed, right? I mean, we can have Christian democracy, we can have social democracy, but democracy has both the aspect of, uh, of uh, the will of the uh, majority, but protecting the rights of minority. So my question is, goes to the, the to Minister Takac. I mean, you, you talk about the, the policies that focus on migration and, and European, um, you know, direction of, of uh, European Union, but what about the problems that we are seeing in Hungary and other places? I mean, I'm in Warsaw coming, you know, not, not a perfect unnecessarily lineup. Um, when it comes to the freedom of the media, when it comes to the political plurality, when it comes to um, rights of minorities, why does it have to come when we talk about uh, will of the people with the, with the problems, uh, with at actually attacking and changing the institutions that actually guarantee uh, our, our democracies. So that's a question to you, to Minister Lajczak. I think I, it's, it's actually, Minister Lajczak, if I just may, I mean, you, 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 you basically said, you know, we should not call the people from the other side deplorables, using the, the words of uh, Hillary Clinton. I could not agree more. But then give us a couple more of concrete ideas of what actually uh, to do to engage people from the other side coming from, let's say, more of the liberal side of the political spectrum. Thanks. Thank you. So, uh, Mr. Lajczak, let me don't turn sure. over to you. First, uh, in answering the question about migration, let me uh, start by saying that I am a person who believes in the European Union. I am a Euro-optimist or Europhile, and I've dedicated considerable part of my professional career to make sure that I bring my country to uh, the European Union. I have worked in the EU, for the EU, I defend the EU. So I, I'm not among those who who fancy criticizing the European Union. I'm a Euro-optimist who is sometimes angry, sometimes frustrated, but still a Euro-optimist. Uh, now, when it comes to the migration crisis and the situation of 2015, I think no one can deny the fact that the initial reaction from the European Union was migrants welcome. There were numbers of politicians wearing the badges. Uh, I did not oppose that, but at that time, we were asking questions. So if we open our borders, is there a limit? Do we have an absorption capacity? This was never mentioned. Is there a capacity to integrate? Uh, uh, well, what is the portion of, of uh, migrants that we can accept so that we, they can still be integrated into the society? So do we want to create a parallel societies in our countries? Probably not. Uh, we were also asking if we uh, accept the philosophy of quotas, how are you going to implement when we are all s s living in Schengen? How are you going to prevent these people from uh, leaving the countries that, uh, I mean, they have accepted them un under the quotas and going to the countries of their original de uh, destination or their the, the dream country. There has never been uh, answers to these questions. I really believe that these questions are uh, legitimate. Second, I'm not denying migration. Migration is a reality. And as a matter of fact, it was under my chairmanship of the UN General Assembly when the General Assembly adopted the Global Compact on Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration, and I consider this uh, one of my achievements here. Uh, so I'm not saying, I'm not labeling. 
I don't like labeling, labeling and I'm not labeling migration. I'm not saying it's a good thing, it's a bad thing. It's a reality, a reality we are still not able to deal with. We, our discussion is still rather ideological. Mm. And what I'm saying is that you cannot address the issue of migration through administrative measures. And uh, the initiative that did come from the Commission, that quotas are the solution, was an administrative measure. Plus, instead of focusing on the root causes, which is what we are doing now, back then in 2015, we were, at, we were trying to address the consequences. And, the, and now, this is no longer the official uh, po policy of the European Union. No one admitted that it was a mistake, and I don't, I don't expect anyone to do so. But the fact is that if we have a problem, we shall look at the, at the causes of the problem. And f first, we'll address these. Obviously, we have to deal with the, with the consequences as well. I see migration as a European problem. It's not a problem for Greece or for Italy. We all have to be part of the solution. But uh, again, I don't think that uh, one size fits all approach is the, is the right approach. And it did not work. And the fact is that, and the second thing that worries me is that what I admire about the European Union is our ability to, after our lengthy discussions, to arrive at a position that everyone can sub subscribe to. And this is what makes the European Union strong. But this was not the case. This was when we discussed migration. There was an attempt or a decision to enforce, impose the solution that was proposed by a group of countries against the will of, of smaller group of countries. This is not how European Union works and how it functions. And, and this is the result, the deepest ever division in the European Union. The, uh, bringing back the old narratives of uh, go good Europe and bad Europe, old Europe and, and, and new Europe, responsible and irresponsible Europe. This makes European Union uh, weaker. And my final point on, on this one, it did not work. It did not work, not, not even 10% of, of the 160,000 migrants that should have been distributed under quotas were distributed. Mm -hmm. And the example of these countries, Baltic countries, shows that these people did not stay here. So this is why we were proposing to find a solution that will work. And we were labeled. And, it, and, and I, I feel very strongly about it. I've been to many battles here. And uh, uh, again, I, I submitted my resignation uh, as a foreign minister after my parliament rejected the global compact and uh, decided that we must not participate in, in, uh, in the Marrakesh discussion. I, 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 I still believe that it was a wrong decision. But, uh, Back then, 2015, instead of listening to the voice of reason coming from Central Europe, we were simply labeled, and it, it never works well. So uh, this is on, on migration and how to engage. You know, this discussion about, about the, the populists is sometimes led from the positions of good and bad, or, you know, we are the right ones, and they are the wrong ones. I would rather suggest to say, they are different ones. So why don't we, we, we sit together and, and try to exchange our, our philosophies, our reasons, our arguments to see where, where, where is the truth. But way too often we refuse to engage and we rather talk about each other or at each other, but not to each other. So I, I really believe in dialogue and, and, and I see less and less dialogue in number of issues here, including the, the, these ones that are that are going to be the, 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 the crucial issues in European elections. And as a matter of fact, look, I'm, I'm a diplomat, a foreign minister. I see, everybody sees what's happening on a global scene. New centers of power emerging. I don't see European Union being among them. Mm. And if we want to see Euro European Union to be part of the, of the, the centers of global, global uh, governance, we need to be united. Mm -hmm. And if we fight against each other, if we label each other, if we exclude each other from being part of the discussion, we will never get there. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Minister Dakar, there's a question to you as well. Yes, but, uh, first let me react very briefly to what the Minister said. I can subscribe to, to all of what he said. I think he, he pointed to a very important elements of uh, the root uh, reasons of this uh, immigration debate. And uh, just a general remark, if uh, if you are not supportive to the European Commission, uh, you are not a federalist, then you are immediately labeled as a Eurosceptic. But he's not. He clearly outlined he's not Eurosceptic. He has done a great job in the UN, OSCE, European Union as well. Uh, 
So we really have to stop this labeling uh, issue. And you know, let me recall that in June 2015, the European Council discussed the immigration after the tragedy at Lampedusa. There was a clear division among the leaders. Uh, three months later in uh, September, 22nd of September 2015, the European Commission laid down a proposal on the relocation quotas, completely against the political decision of the Prime Ministers. So that's the, that's, the, that's the problem with the European Commission. We Hungarians, we had a proposition recently, the Prime Minister, that we should depoliticize all this immigration debate, which will stay with us for a long time. If you look at the demography and economics of large parts of the world, South Asia, Middle East, North Africa, Africa, South of the Sahara, uh, you know the story. We should create a new council, the Council of the Interior Ministers of the Schengen Member States. They should make the decisions, member states. And uh, accidentally, this was the, the same proposition came from President Macron, who you cannot really accuse of being very close to Orban. But uh, both of them had the same proposition on how to move ahead. Uh, by the way, they are also thinking along the same lines when we talk about European security, creating a European army. Uh, brackets closed. Media freedom. Uh, well, I mean, you might be frustrated with the government, or not you, but anybody, in, in Poland, because you are not a peace supporter, or you are not a Fidesz supporter in, in Hungary. But just saying that there is no media freedom because you don't like the political results. I mean, if you are really interested in the freedom of media in Hungary, you should analyze it deeply. You should come, you should see, you should watch, you should switch on the TV, go on the internet, go to the news desk and, and buy daily newspapers. What I can tell you is the largest electronic media outlet in Hungary, RTL Club, is owned by Bertelsmann, very anti-government, operates freely. The largest online media index is very anti-government. They just had a, an issue about myself as well two days ago. We're not criticizing, it's part of the freedom of media. The largest printed media outlet is also anti-government. I don't know when you say that there is no media freedom in Hungary or in Poland, I can, yeah, you, should, you should revisit the media landscape in this country, in Germany, in France, and you can make some analysis there as well. I mean, saying that there is no media freedom, we don't see the evidences. You can use it as a political tool in a political campaign, it's fine, it's part of politics, but you know, we are without evidences, just accusations, insinuations, perception creation, this doesn't lead us anywhere. So, of course, I don't want to go into the defensive line that but, I mean, this is the reality. What are we talking about when you say there is no media freedom? Just because this government has won two-thirds majority in three consecutive elections, it doesn't mean that we are not established democracy. This is the wish of the people. We had citizens' consultations on several topics, not only immigration, many other issues. We are consulting with the people. And just because we are consulting with the people doesn't mean that we are populist. So let me make it clear. I mean, this, th there should be a, a real distinction, and not just creating the scene. And what uh, the minister said about Europe's uh, relevance in the world, that's a real problem. Because on the one hand, uh, two major is issues that have always been uh, the, the basic pillars of uh, the legitimacy behind the European Union is security of Europe and economic competitiveness. Neither of them is there. That's why people are frustrated and disillusioned with the European Union, while new power centers are emerging, and Europe is becoming less and less relevant in the world, and that's a problem as well. Thank you. So we're entering the lightning round, um, so I'm going to take a few questions together. Um, I saw a question here, gentlemen, um, Ian, Agnia, and then we'll take the next batch. And I'll ask our speakers to please keep their answers brief. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I think you're m omitting something. The Council of Ministers of the Interior in Luxembourg Sorry, could voted. you introduce yourself? Yes, sorry. Alexander Lambsdorff, one of the last surviving liberals, <laughs> um, member of the German Bundestag. Um, Miroslav, uh, thank you for what you've said. Also on your, on your position on the Migration Pact. But what I wanted to say is it was the Council of Interior Ministers who voted in Luxembourg to accept the quotas. The Commission cannot impose the quota. It was the governments who did it at Germany's behest. It was Germany who was pushing the decision through. It was very bad European diplomacy, but it was the governments who decided it was not the Commission, number one. Number two, um, Minister, do you know the difference between a small L liberal and a big L liberal, capital L? You cannot have illiberal democracy. It is about as useful as an atheist church. 
or a vegetarian slaughterhouse. It simply does not work. Unless you respect fundamental freedoms, unless you respect the freedom of professors to teach what they want without chasing the university to Vienna, unless you respect the freedom of Radio Contact to broadcast what they want, unless you respect Nebsabatschok's line, editorial line, you cannot have a liberal democracy. You cannot have a democracy full stop. And therefore, when you are a liberal democrat, Christian Schmidt is sitting there, a Bavarian conservative, a Christian Democrat, but he believes in liberal democracy, and then on the basis of that, we have our competing political views, a liberal, a socialist, a conservative, competing on that foundation. I think it is crucial, and you said it uh, earlier, Adam, uh, that this does not get lost. Hungary no longer is a democracy. It does not provide a fair competition during elections, and yes, I have been to Hungary, and yes, I have analyzed the situation. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you. Uh, Let's, can we hold? There's a lot of questions. I would just ask our panelists to be patient. Um, I think you were mentioned directly, if I'm not mistaken, so I do want to give a quick opportunity here before taking it over to um, the other two in this Christian panel. Schmidt, Christian Democrat, Christian Social Union, member of the presidency of the European People's Party. So I am among those who were very close with the decisions. By the way, um, my dear friend, don't compare to David Cameron. David Cameron's decision to bring the Tories out of EPP was just one of his few but very important tactical failures Strategy. which he made on his own decision. St I would uh, call them it strategic. was nothing, nothing about um, uh, PPE, it was his the simple Tory decision, thinking that he could in this way manage to get us keeping together. First, second, I think we have indeed to understand that, I don't have a tradition, but to understanding what, what the historical development has been. And there's a question uh, to, should I say to the right uh, <laughs> wing, <laughs> no, to your analysts. You said, the losers of uh, globalization. This was a political wording 10 years ago, 15 years ago. If I look in my country, I do see that these are not uh, AfD. It's not only the political losers of globalization, complicated to define what this is. It's the middle class. It's uh, our intellectuals uh, who have their problems uh, with our way to make policy. This is the one. The second, understanding. I, I, I think everybody who goes to Budapest should have a visit uh, to the House of Terror to understand uh, from where uh, Hungary is coming. And uh, probably uh, the 19th of August uh, this year, everybody knows in the room uh, surely uh, what anniversary this is. If not, the 19th of August was a pan-European picnic where the Hungarians opened the Iron Curtain uh, to the West East Germans to flee over Austria to West uh, Germany in these times and laid the cornerstone for uh, German unif uh, European unification. So I think if you, you grab and say, um, we are, this is right, this liberal, illiberal, uh, I think one has to understand, and this is my question, what impact is about political experience in the last, last 50 years? Sir, the second you, is, we're yeah, out of time. I finish, uh, but just um, one thing, uh, you know what, where fetus comes, the wording, how they called themselves in the beginning? The young liberals. Yes, thank you. Um, Idea of Victor Thank you Orban, very much. By the way. Um, Ian, <laughs> Anya, David, and that's that's a wrap. Please introduce yourself. Please ask a yeah. question. Hi, Ian Bond from the Centre for European Reform. Um, I, I thought Anton's analysis of the two betrayals was really interesting, and we've talked basically about one, which is to say the migration crisis, which is kind of ludicrous. I mean, Hungary has five thousand Muslims in a population of ten million. Uh, the, the numbers, even at the height of the, uh, the crisis, the numbers of people who migrated to Europe were still relatively small as a percentage of 500 million people living in the European Union. What we haven't talked about at all is the first betrayal. It's the fact that since the financial crisis, 
the, the inequalities that developed have not been narrowed at all. And what I would like to hear from the two ministers is what is going to be done by European governments and by the EU after the, the elections to tackle the problem of persistent inequality? Because at the moment, it seems to me we're blaming the poorest of the poor who are coming from developing countries while completely ignoring the fact that most of the recovery since 2008, 2009 has gone into the pockets of the 1%, including me. Thank you, Ian. Anya, please. Right here. Agnia Grigas, Atlantic Council. Could, could the panel and perhaps Minister Takasha shed light on why these, uh, well, new Christian Democrats or illiberal Democrats or I don't know, I guess populists as uh, uh, the critics call them, why they find so much affinity with the autocratic governments uh, of Russia, for example. So I uh, would love to hear that. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, David, you have the final word before we turn it back to the panel. Thanks, uh, David Kramer, Florida International University. Mis Mr. Minister, I wanted to ask you, uh, you were right to draw a distinction between refugees and migration. My question is how many refugees is Hungary accepted? Um, and the second question is the impression among many in the United States is that uh, anti-Semitism is a problem throughout Europe. It's a problem in my country, of course. What is your government doing about it? It seemed to have uh, engaged in it in the attacks against George Soros. I'd be interested in your reaction to that. Thank you. Thank you, David. So now we have five minutes. I want to give um, all of our panelists uh, an opportunity to respond to whatever part of that. Don't feel the need to respond to everything that was just put on the table. And let me just start in a sort of reverse order. So, so Tom, let me get you to comment on anything you've heard from the audience. Well, really briefly, I wanted to amplify the point that was made here about losers of globalization. I think this is not, on the whole, a useful frame to understand the, the growth of populism, or certainly not exclusively. Um, you said that, that, that you see plenty of um, people who <coughs> for whom that description does not apply voting for the AFD. Certainly, it's not a useful frame at all for understanding Brexit if you break down the, the, the composition of the, of the pro-leave electorate. Um, so I think we need to be careful to avoid slipping into that frame. Um, second point, which relates to the, um, something that was just said about support for autocratic governments, that there was an interesting line in this Austrian scandal. Uh, there's so much there, and I recommend that everybody goes away and reads the reporting because it's fascinating. There was an interesting line that uh, Straka said to the woman who he believed was the niece of a Russian oligarch, you in Russia live a normal life, we in the West lead a decadent life. And I think that's a, an interesting line, quite a telling one, and I think quite an animating Someone idea for a lot of Russia the people. Recently. Yeah, well, for a lot of people who, who look to, to Russia and look to Putin as, um, as the repository of, of some sort of imagined um, Judeo-Christian utopia. Uh, and the final point, uh, which is this, uh, this might migration discussion, which has kind of been a thread running throughout this, um, this entire session, um, I find it very frustrating that both sides of this debate, as I were, seem far too ready to don the mantle of being pro-immigration or anti-immigration. Um, all it does is polarize the debate, make it much more difficult to find common ground. During the refugee crisis in 2015, 2016, we found ourselves in this completely absurd argument about quotas, and I actually agree with the minister that it was completely wrong to um, uh, for that decision to have been forced through by, by, by a QMV, but that's ancient history now. Um, the refugee crisis wasn't in Europe. The refugee crisis was in Syria and the countries surrounding it. And the difficulty was we were locking ourselves into this argument about are we going to send a few hundred here, a, a few hundred there. Um, and if you don't do that, then you're anti-migrant. And if you're in favor of that, then you're pro-migrant. And in the end, we completely lost sight of what the actual discussion should have been, which is how do we manage the fact that you have several million Syrian refugees largely still in the region, and what is the correct way way to apportion responsibility, how many should Europeans resettle, to what extent should we be attempting to help them in situ, and I still think that that discussion has been a little bit lost, partly because it became so polarized back in 2015. Thanks, Tom. Um, Anton, very quickly over to you, since we're going in reverse yeah, order. Yeah, so when we when, when look at the electorate of the right-wing populist, of course it's not only losers of globalization. And I would, um, I don't want to go in much into detail, but uh, essentially public opinion polls done in uh, various, well, all the continents of the world show that the Europeans are the most unhappy uh, uh, nation among others because they don't believe 
the, the, the majority of Europeans do not believe that the next generation will have you know, uh, a better life. And that's a, that's a contrasting, contrasting uh, result uh, among, the, among other, all the other uh, nations. And people who do not believe in their own future, they have this anxiety which populists, they, they, they feed off these anxieties. But again, as I said, they're not trying to ease those anxieties, to, to address those fears. They're trying to capitalize on them in order to stay in power or to come into power. But it's, I, I totally agree, the losers of globalization is not the only reason for the rise of the far right, but it's, but it's one of the, of the most important ones, that the people were betrayed and their future was betrayed. They, they feel this way. Again, I'm trying to play a devil's advocate here. There is a, there is a, a lot of objective uh, truth in what right-wing populists say. The problem is that they ask very good questions. The answers they provide are not necessarily good. Thank you, Anton. Uh, Minister, please. You have a lot of, a lot of yeah. questions to you, so yeah, I would ask to you to try to keep it as brief as possible. All right. Uh, maybe first reacting to, uh, to you about David Cameron. I, I'm not saying that uh, I did not exactly what you meant when, when I referred to David Cameron. I just recall that neither him nor us liked the Spitz and Kandidat of five years ago. That was the similarity between the two. I don't know if it was a tactical mistake to, to drag the Tories out of the EPP. We will see. Uh, we believe that EPP has also made some tactical mistakes, but as I told you, it's, it's many uh, sectoral... Sir, you asked your question. Thank you. All right, okay. But so many sectoral policy, policy issues that we cannot subscribe to, regardless of anything. Is Spitzenkandidat is only one. Uh, Could you answer the specific question that David Kramer posed about the number Russia. of refugees, the hunger uh, Refugees. You see, uh, I think Tom Nottel said that the refugee crisis was in Jordan, in Lebanon, and in Turkey, if you talk about Syria. Uh, the refugees coming from these obviously war zone countries are in a safe country now. They are living in very difficult conditions in uh, refugee camps. That's why the European Union signed a treaty, a deal with Turkey, uh, that we have to financially and politically support the Turkish government. As much as we will have to strike the same deals with countries in the, in the Horn of Africa, Senegal, Eritrea, Morocco, Tunisia, and you name know, many countries of origin, this is part of the solution. We have to solve the problem outside Europe. I mean, it's very easy to uh, differentiate. How many refugees Hungary has taken? When Hungary was the first safe country to refugees, we did not consider who they are. The Yugoslav war 25 years ago, we opened our borders. We didn't care if somebody was coming from Bosnia, Bosnia, from Bosnia, Serbia, Croat, because we were the first safe country. And the first safe country is Turkey now, it's not Hungary. So if there is a normal procedure of asylum seeking and, and, you, and, you, and if you are a refugee, obviously we will uh, go through this procedure, but we are not talking about refugees. Franz Timmermans, who cannot be either accused of being too close to Hungarian government, he said that the Syrians are not in the top ten nationality of people who are coming uh, to Europe. So we are talking about the refugee crisis, we are talking about an immigration challenge, a phenomenon. Needs are completely different. Uh, Anti-Semitism, well, I mean, it would be too short time to tell you what we have done. Uh, in Hungary, according to fundamental rights agency, but also according to a German Dutch report survey that has been just uh, revealed in Jerusalem the other day, Hungary is the country in the European Union which is most supportive to the State of Israel in foreign political fora, the United Nations, European Union, elsewhere. Uh, we are creating a security environment for the Hungarian Jewish community, which is one of the largest community. It is very well recognized by the State of Israel, not only Bibi Netanyahu and his uh, right-wing government, but also the two opposition figures who are, by the way, Hungarian origin, uh, Benny Gantz and Yair Lapid, are, they are all, all coming from Hungary. Uh, it is widely recognized. There is a, a continuous high-level encounter between the two prime ministers in Israel and in, and in Hungary. Uh, and George Soros, uh, we, are not, we are not listing who is Jewish, who is not. We don't know why you, you bring it in. We would defend Mr. Soros only on one occasion, if somebody is attacking him because of his origin. We don't have any problem with Mr. Soros because he is coming from, the, from a Jewish background. We don't care about this. We have a problem with his policy of open societies and multiculturalism to Europe and supporting illegal practices of human traffickers, NGOs, 
This is what we have a problem with. Mr. Trump has the same problem with him. Mr. Netanyahu and the State of Israel has the same problem. If you follow this logic, then Netanyahu is also anti-Semitic, which would be quite absurd and bizarre. So uh, if you look at the surveys about anti-Semitism all over Europe, Hungary has nothing to be ashamed of, on the contrary. Uh, so this is the Russia, uh, autocratic government. Look, uh, many countries are cooperating with Russia. I could on, just on ask you very pragmatic briefly. terms. Uh, think about the Nord Stream 2 issue, cooperation between Germany and Russia, cooperation between France and Russia, Italy and Russia. You cannot single out any member state. Everybody is trying to have a pragmatic, and we believe, like others, that the sanction policy of the European Union should not be on the only policy for Russia, I think we need to have a much more pragmatic cooperation between the European continent, the European Union, and Russia. The same with China. You know, the Central, Central Eastern European region, 16 or 17 countries now, Greece joined. Our share with the uh, EU-China trade is less than 10%. 91% of trade between China and the European Union are done by Western European countries. There's a huge imbalance. Uh, Huawei signed a strategic cooperation agreement with Deutsche Telekom and Vodafone. So, are these member states are cooperating with autocratic governments? I don't think. There's pragmatism on okay. this. Thank you very much. And uh, last word to you, Minister Lechek. Uh, please Thank you. briefly. I'll be brief. Yeah. I, I, I usually am. Uh, yes, uh, <laughs> uh, to you, uh, Mr. Lambsdorff. Let's be honest. Uh, of course, how many extraordinary summits there were to address the issue of, of migration, how many times it was said that this is the biggest crisis, biggest challenge EU is facing, and yet the decision was sent to the Council of Ministers of Interior as if the migration is a phenomenon that only the Ministers of Inter Interior have to deal with. And it was adopted, the Commission's proposal was adopted with a qualified majority uh, vote, because in the, if it was dealt by the European Council, there is a consensus there. So we were not honest with each other, and now we, we see the consequences. And to Ian, about the inequality, my suggestion for the new European institutions, the European Commission, would be go back to basics, deliver on the original promise of Europe, because there is still lots of work to do. First, Europe of rules. Respect the rules. We are a community of rules, and all of us, big and small. Second, peace and, peace and stability promote, project peace and stability, particularly in our neighborhood, to the east, to the south. For this, we need a credible European foreign policy, which we don't have right now. Number three, let's complete the big integration projects, particularly the single market and the eurozone. Number four, equality, and so that people feel equal, which is not the case now. For this, we need to strengthen cohesion and convergence in European policies. And finally, number five, people's Europe, uh, Europe that brings hope and vision for the people, that people feel that it, this is the Europe that works for them, and the Europe that makes sure that every next generation is better off than the one before. Thank you, Minister, for providing us a concrete and positive agenda for the future. Uh, before we thank our panel, we have a few administrative logistical announcements from the organization.